Well, I you need to sip water. Yeah. <laughs> we'll just kind of change it up a little bit. Oh, it's pretty casual. It's okay. It's it's pretty casual, yeah. Um, my name is Sandy Arnold, and um, I am the patient, and my husband is my caregiver, and I've had carcinoid cancer since 2009. And I look out here and I see everybody looks so good and so healthy and we have smiling faces. So who would dream that we're doing a cancer conference today? Um, I'm going to read from my script because I get kind of nervous. But uh, first thing, uh, if the real important is the bathrooms. Um, if you go out to the information uh, desk, the men's uh, bathroom is before you get to the information desk and the women's bathroom is on the left side. Um, Try not to flush when you're doing this. <laughs> okay, no flushing today. Um, the, the Carcinoid Cancer Texas Survivors Support Group welcomes everyone to this conference today. Uh, it was uh, brought up at uh, our meeting a few weeks ago, or a few months ago, that we'd love to have Dr. Lou come down here. I actually had a conference call with him that following Monday for uh, my health reasons, and I said, Dr. Lou, would you come to Dallas? <laughs> he goes, I've never been to Dallas. Sure, I'd love to come. <laughs> so here he is. Um, so it, we'd like to welcome any newcomers to our group, and uh, raise some hands who's a newcomer. Welcome, welcome. Welcome, oh, wow, thanks so much for coming. Um, we do have some information on the table about when we meet. We do meet on the second Saturday of each month from 11 to 1. And uh, it will make you feel a lot better to come. I know when I first came, it was so nice to meet individuals that had my disease. It just makes you feel so much better. I also want to thank everyone for their general, generous donations. Without your donations, uh, we could not have had the conference today. And I want to thank all the volunteers for helping the many hours to get this uh, uh, conference completed. Um, today our agenda is we're going to let Dr. Luke for, talk for about a, uh, a minute, <laughs> for about an hour, <laughs> for about an hour, and then we'll take a 15 minute break, and we're going to do some door prizes, as you see up on the stage, and uh, then uh, Dr. Luke will answer some questions. Following the conference, we do have to be out of the room at 1 o'clock. Um, we're going to go to the cafeteria. Dr. Lou's going to have lunch. And anyone that would like to meet with him, ask him more questions, he'll be available. Uh, we do have to get him to the airport by around 3 o'clock, 3.30, for his uh, flight home. Uh, his wife and his three kids were gracious enough to let him come today. Um, a little bit about Dr. Lou. Um, he graduated from Harvard. Uh, he did his uh, med school at Columbia, and then he did some training at Uppsala, Sweden, <laughs> and um, he's uh, the director of the Neuroendocrine uh, Center at Vanderbilt uh, University in Nashville, Tennessee. And we are so happy for him to be here. So let's put our hands together and give him a big Texas <laughs> You know, I, when I got here, I thought, oh my God, it's going to be so hot there. <laughs> the first thing I thought, so I said, you know, I, I'm sorry, you expect me to wear a suit. I said, I'm to wear a suit. So I said, I should wear a short sleeve shirt. So, I'm not, so this is the shirt I wore. He's a real kind of, like you guys, a real crusader in this kind of crusade that we're on. And uh, he got all these shirts printed for his family. Or oh, actually, his family got it printed for him. That's kind of a big gift. And so here, he got one made just for me. So, oh. <laughs> I that was kind of neat. So, so, you know, hey, look, you're, if, you, if you felt alone for a little while, guess what? You're no longer alone. You're now part of a family. You're part of a larger community. You may not all live together. 
humanity live close to each other. But I guess this is Texas, so everyone's living really far away. But there are 100,000 people, at least, just like you, walking around this United States of ours. So as I go around and I try to preach the gospel of Nuremberg and the carcinoid, I meet a lot of people. And you know what? A lot of people are just doing just great, right? And I hear all the time, gosh, you look so good. How can you possibly have cancer? And it's just, you know, in, in one way, I feel very privileged because, you know, you can keep people. Actually, you know, this is something where I can actually do something to make people better. And, uh, and so it's, it's great that way. So just know that you're not alone. And, uh, you know, you have a lot of people around you who can help you. And chances are, if you ever have a question, someone's already gone through it. So just reach out to people and don't feel like you're ever all by yourself in this. Even if your doctor treats you like you're all by yourself, you are not. So take, the, take the, your care into your own hands and, and know that you are your number one best advocate and that there are people, there are specialists all around the country who really care about you too and think about you all the time. I, I keep telling people, you know, I literally wake up in the morning, I think about it. I go to bed, I think about it. And, and at some point, I'm just like, gosh, I wish we could cure it so I could stop thinking about it. That would be great. So, here's today's agenda. Okay, you're going to get a little neurointervention 101. Okay? So we have a lot of new faces here, I guess it sounds like. So, you know, I, I'm happy to kind of talk as, as, as far back as you like. And so for some of you old-timers who've been dealing with this for a decade, you know, you'll get a little refresher course on chrono brain and stuff. Um, but I'll, I'll try to move along because then I want to make sure you have enough time. We have enough time at the end so I can just kind of sit here and answer questions for you. Because I really think ultimately that's probably the most important thing. You can look this stuff up. Uh, but there are a lot of categories. So here's what we're going to do. We'll talk a little bit about what is neuroendocrine, right? Because, you know, what is carcinoma? What is neuroendocrine? What's that all about? What diagnostics? So essentially, what do the tests mean? Right? And really, what test did you get? Pathology, right? You get a pathology, like, well, what am I reading here? Does this make sense? Is this even in English, right? So we'll, I'll translate that for you. And probably the most important thing, which is therapy. So really, what should I do? And, and as I always say, it's not always what to do, it's really when to do it. That's the art of neuroendocrine, is when to do these things, okay? And I'll tell you a little bit about some of the stuff we do at Vanderbilt, and then, you know, it'll be fine. But if you have a question, just kind of chime in, right? I mean, I'm happy, look, it's very formal. I'm standing here in a t-shirt, so, <laughs> you know, formalities are not that important to me. Your, your health and your understanding is the most important thing to me, okay? So I'm gonna stand here and rant and rave. <laughs> okay, so what is it? So basically, you have to understand, the neuroendocrine system is very, very, in general, is very poorly understood, okay? Because these were cells that are scattered throughout your body. Okay, right? So we say, oh, eating. Oh, yeah, everyone eats. Breathing. Oh, everyone breathes, right? Those are phenomenally complicated systems. It is so good and such a testament to Mother Nature when we were created that we almost take it for granted, right? But it is not so easy, and it's very complicated. And, when it, and the only time you know it's complicated is when it's broken and it doesn't work well, right? So a lot of you probably your tummy's hurt, right, over time and things like that. Think about the people who have trouble breathing. It's very, very difficult. And so basically, your body's evolved these little small cells that secrete hormones. And they're scattered all throughout, so no one really thinks about them because they're not an organ, right? It's not like an adrenal or a thyroid or even a pituitary or even, even a, kind of even a pancreas even. They're just kind of scattered all throughout. And they work very quietly and silently. And it's, it's taken like 100 years for us to figure out what they do. But every now and then, and what they do is they, they make a bunch of these hormones. They make serotonin, they make insulin, they make gastrin. They help you secrete acid, they help you control glucose, they help you control the water flow. I mean, all these amazing things that it does. And every now and then they turn to tumors, right? But the, the thing about all these cells, they express something called somatostatin receptors, okay? And that's, some, that's a key point that you can understand. So terminology-wise, so you have to understand, back in 1907 when this, this old German guy first described it, he said, you know what? These are like cancer, but they're not like cancer. So I'm gonna call them carcinoid, that's what we call it, right? And so he did, while it was true, you know, they weren't normal cancers, they weren't like colon cancer or prostate cancer, or what we traditionally call adenocarcinoma. These are certainly very much very, very tumors and very, very malignant. And it took him about 20 years later before we started collecting more patients. He said, oh my gosh, I made a terrible mistake. In fact, this is a highly malignant, highly dangerous, deadly disease. Unfortunately, the term carcinoma is stuck for 100 years, right? So when you go to, tell, tell me if you've ever heard this, oh, you have carcinoma, you don't really have cancer. 
right? Right. right? You've heard that before from, from healthcare professionals, right? So people who, in theory, are supposed to know something about this. So you are you are living this, okay? And they used to call all these weird things. They were called everything was called a carcinoid for a while, and then they called them deep pyomas. And sometimes you'll see island cell tumors, and then sometimes it's neuroendocrine carcinoma. So you kind of hear all these kind of weird terms. But it's kind of settled out over time, okay? And that's the good thing about it. So let me let me just tell you how it works out now. So in general, think of it as an umbrella term. Okay, the umbrella term is called neuroendocrine tumor, okay, or neuro neuroendocrine cancer, whatever you want to call it. So the neuroendocrine. And it divides essentially into two kind of branches. The first one is a carcinoid. And a carcinoid comes from a tube of some sort. So a breathing tube or a digestive tube. Okay? So that's how you can think of carcinoid. And they generally, not always, but they generally grow relatively slowly. Okay? And, and uh, in general, they secrete some kind of hormone. Not always, right? So you know, I always tell people, I say, look, if you've seen one neuroendocrine patient, you've seen one neuroendocrine patient, right? Because every one of these is very different. But in general, that's kind of what they do. That's how we think about it. And then there are neuroendocrine tumors in the center of the pancreas, so we call them pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. That's kind of the other big class of them. And they make a whole bunch of different hormones and they can really kind of wreak havoc in people's lives. So that's how you can kind of think of it. So the, the blanket term is neuroendocrine cancer or neuroendocrine tumor, okay? And again, the one thing I want to stress to you is that they all, almost all of them suppress this somatostatin receptor. And, and we use that to our advantage, right? Why? Because just imagine this is your tumor cell, okay? And you have these receptors that are that are kind of floating around, and they bind to this somatostatin. Okay, and what does that do, right? So I always say, I always say it was a good thing that that God created somatostatin because it would be terrible to have diarrhea when you're chased by a tiger or something. Like that. <laughs> that would be really bad. But we use this for our advantage. So here's the molecule. Here's somatostatin. Okay, and it's just it's not rocket science. Right? I'm really not that smart. So if I can figure it out, you can figure it out. Somato means body, and statin means stop. Okay, so this is a hormone, a natural hormone that stops kind of the bodily functions that you have intentionally, intentionally, right? Because you want to slow things down. And the reason is because is because and the thing that we've done is we take advantage of that, right? So we've taken this somatostatin and we've taken this receptor and we've used it to our advantage so we can treat people with it, we can image people with it. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. So let me tell you a little more classification, right, just so you can get a better feel. So remember I told you there's a pancreatic endocrine tumors, right, and they can make a bunch of different hormones, and this is what's difficult, right? It's, it's, there are lots of different endocrine tumors to talk about, right? So in a way, that's kind of job security for me, but it causes confusion for everyone else, right? So here are the, these peanuts, they can make a bunch of different hormones, okay? But you can also have peanuts that make no hormone, okay? And they can be, can be completely asymptomatic. And then you have these carcinoids, okay? And the carcinoids can come from the lungs or the stomach or the duodenum, very, very common. Most of them come from the small bowel, it's probably what most of you guys are, are facing. And then some of them come from the rectum, and they can come from other unusual sites as well, too. But that's kind of how it breaks down, so you get a feel for that. Right? Now, the funny thing about neurotic tumors is it was used to be called a rare cancer, okay? And some people still kind of consider it a rare cancer. And, and the quoted number is about 2.5 to 5 per 100,000 people. So it's, let's say it's uncommon. I'll say it's uncommon. But you know, here's the problem, and I can't really tell you a lot of detail about why this is, but at least in the early 80s, this was a very rare, this was a rare disease, okay? And it started to creep up. And I would, I would give you, yeah, maybe this has to do with kind of detection and CT scans and classification, stuff like that. But you can see here, it continues to creep up and creep up and creep up and creep up and creep up. So, you know, by the time we have now, we actually may have many more patients than we think. And, you know, I, I kind of do these talks all around. And I'll talk to doctors, and the doctors will, yeah, you know, I am seeing more of these carcinomas I used to see. So there's something to it. I don't really know what it is. So that, you're really not alone. And if you look at the various organs, right, so they come from different organs, like I told you, you can see here most of the other kind of rare neurotic so there are even rare of the rare are kind of relatively stable, but you can see the ones that have really gone up a lot. Here's the lung, right? That's gone up a lot. Here's your small intestine, which has gone up a lot. And here's your rectum. And I'll bet rectum actually is mostly from colonoscopy, right? Because we've done really a lot of colonoscopies now. That's very important. But there's something about the small bowel and lung one that, that's, that's kind of growing. And, and, you know, unfortunately, the lung carcinoids feel even more in because they're, they're seeing people who really have no food. So it's a, it's a real challenge, not only for the physician and the healthcare professional, but also for you guys. But there's something happening, there's something going on. Now, there is something you have to understand, okay? 
there's a difference between incidence and prevalence, right? So incidence for America is, relative, is still relatively low. That's just basically the number of people who show up each year, the new diagnosed patients. But the prevalence, which is the number of people who are walking around the country, okay, is very, very high. Why? Look, this is a hepatobiliary cancer, okay? Liver cancer, very low. Esophageal cancer, low. Pancreatic cancer, low. Anyone know why the, like, the prevalence of these diseases are so low? Because these people are dead in two or three years. Okay, right? They, we really cannot, almost can't stop those diseases. I mean, it's getting better and better. But really, there are very few people walking around with, with this disease. Even stomach cancer. But look at that. Right? This is a, supposed, this uncommon rare disease, right? There are at least 100,000 people walking around. I wouldn't be surprised if there are twice that many. You don't even know about it. So it's, it's, there are a lot of people it affects. It touches a lot of people. Let me tell you about how it kind of shows up too so you get a feel for it. And this may be your story, right? So there are people who have these rectal carcinoids and most of the time the yellow is just kind of localized disease which means just kind of right in the spot where it started from. And that's great, right? Because if you have metastatic rectal carcinoid, that is a very difficult disease to take care of. It's in your bones, it's in your brain, it's, it can be very tough. Lung carcinoma is another one. You can see about 50% of these are picked up when it's still localized. What does that mean? That means they had they were going for a nose job or a hernia repair or something else. They got a chest x-ray for that operation. And oh gosh, did you know you had a mass in your chest? Right? I mean that's not so great when you're gonna get your like, you know, your ears fixed or whatever. But that's what happens. That's what happens. And you know, another quarter of them show up with very uh, distant metastatic disease. Now look at the small bowel. The minority of patients show up with disease primary in their small bowel. By the time they walk in the door, they already have metastases either to their lymph nodes, so what we call regional metastases, or heck, to their liver, bones, or wherever they swim. So this small bowel carcinoid is very challenging to take care of. And it is, it is also the most common one we see. And the problem, the problem is it takes five to seven years for a diagnosis to come around, right? When was the last time someone said to you, oh, you've got some diarrhea, you must have irritable bowel. So that's very, very common. And look, I don't begrudge the primary care physicians. They have to see people every four minutes, or something ridiculous like that. And you know, to make a diagnosis, you know, I'm a specialist, so I kind of have luxury sitting with you and talking to you and thinking about you and, and ordering tests and stuff like that. But you know, if you've got four minutes to figure something out, you just you can't do it. So it's very easy to say you have your own bowel, here's your pneumonia. Right? And then that's what you do. So it's a very common story. And I can't even imagine what it must feel like to, to say someone's had your for four years and all of a sudden they have cancer, right? So it's, it's not so easy. And here's the problem, right? So here's the survival of in, in our country of people with uh, metastatic carcinoma. You can see here, it's still not so great. You know, by the time you get to five, six, seven years, you're only talking about 30, 20, 30, 40% of people alive. Right? Now, if you are, if you have pancreas cancer, I said, oh, you're gonna live five years. That is a oncologic triumph, right? If you are 35 years old with metastatic carcinoma, and I say, you know what, I'm gonna keep you alive for five years, you don't wanna hear that, right? So it's it's much harder for carcinomas, right? So we can consider that. All right, so our goal is to take it from this and put it way, way up here, right? That's our goal, that's what we're gonna do. So let me just give you some more feeling about the kind of survival. So location really makes a big difference. If you talk about just localized disease, okay, people do very, very well. I mean, look, this is 10 years, so they, you know, essentially they're essentially they're cured of it. Even with lymph node disease, people live for a long time. It's really that metastatic disease. But remember, I told you most people walk in the door with metastatic disease, right? So you go from essentially, you know, you know, 200 months to 100 months out of 33 months. Okay? Now there is a different kind of beast that I want to warn you, warn you about. There's a, something called poorly differentiated neuroendocrine carcinoma, okay. That is an angry, angry, angry version of neuroendocrine. This is kind of the good, the bad, and the ugly. Okay, think of it that way. So this is what we call grade three disease. People who have that disease essentially cannot survive it. Okay, and I don't care if you're 25 years old and you can't survive it. And so you can see the, how, how challenging it is to take care of. Look at this, these are the survivors. So it's kind of a different beast, right? So when people see these numbers and they say, oh, it's neuroendocrine, they're all the same. Guess what, they're not all the same. So just always think very carefully, you know, make sure you, you have someone who understands what's going on, make sure you understand what's going on, okay? Because that makes a big difference. I have seen many patients, many patients who have come to me who have been diagnosed with like a poorly differentiated, you know, neuroendocrine or whatever. 
and then we review their patent. No, it's not. You know, they're told you have to go to chemo, you should get your affairs ready, it's time for hospice. And they come to me and say, no, you actually don't have that. You actually have a well-differentiated, low inclusive disease um, that you know, should be taken care of this way, this way, this way. So just, just understand that, right? There's a lot of information you don't want to lose there. Now, there is something, that, there is kind of a triumph I do want to mention to you. You guys are probably all uh, recipients of that, of that good triumph, is that you can see here, localized disease, regional disease, actually the survival was, has been pretty equivalent over the years. But you can see here, there's a huge separation here in the curves after 1988. That's actually after the invention of octreotide and samostatin. So that drug actually, you know, I'm not here to pitch it at all, but that drug actually changed the course of this disease. So just understand that, that if you're on that medication, it is, it is served you well, it has served thousands and thousands and thousands of people very well, and actually help them live longer and better lives. Okay, so let me give you a feel for this one more time. So here you're, you're, you're kind of good and kind of bad tumors. They actually do pretty well. You can see the survival probably is very, very good. Whereas if you have a very aggressive tumor, it's no different than having aggressive lung cancer. Okay, so it's an aggressive kind of disease. So it gives you a context, and that's why the information is so important. So you can just imagine, you can have a 53-year-old lady come with very vague abdominal pain, and she can have denitis with an irritable bowel, you can have a 40-year-old nurse who presents and she's passing out. You can have a 62-year-old guy who comes in with a small bowel obstruction out of nowhere. You can have a 59-year-old guy who comes in with kidney stones, right? He gets a CAT scan and is all of a sudden diagnosed with a nerve right? So this is how, the, how people show up. It's very tricky. They show up in all different ways. And you know what they can show up with that? And this patient is asymptomatic, right? So it's, it's, it's very tricky. So when you, when you talk to someone, you know, let, let's talk about carcinoma. You know, that's kind of a, a classic thing. So most of the time people have diarrhea, but you have to know how to ask the question. You say, well, does it wake you up at night? Right? How many times do you go? Are you afraid of leaving your house? Right? And that's very, those are important questions for me to ask because I want to know not only like, what's your severe dehydrated, what's your electrolyte problem, but how headed are you to your house? Can you not leave your home because you're afraid of going to the bathroom? You know what, I mean, that's a huge reduction in someone's quality of life if they feel like you cannot leave their house, right? So I'll say to them, say, you know, do you know every bathroom from here along I-40? And if they say yes, I know they probably have parcel in. <laughs> then you say, how do you flush, right? How many times do you flush? Does it occur randomly? Do you sweat, right? Because how many times have you heard, oh, you, you're flushing? Surely you have menopause, mm -hmm. right? Surely you have menopause. So let me tell you something. I tell the story a lot, so if you heard before, I apologize. But, but after, when I had just arrived from, um, from Sweden, I literally just drove home uh, from the airport, and we had the whole family, and it was the middle of the day, and so I was really tired. And we turned on the TV, and the only thing that's on is, is, is this very famous medical show in the middle of the day, the... Dr. Asha. Dr. Asha. <laughs> Dr. Asha. So Dr. Asha was on, and I'd never seen it before, but it's, you know, it's good. It seems like a good show. And so he has a show, it's in, in, in the theme, you know how he's like themes of the show? So this theme is called Am I Normal? I was like, oh my God, that's loaded to start with. <laughs> but, it's, but it's called Am I Normal? And, um, and uh, he goes to a young man, right? And he says, uh, you know, sir, please tell me, you know, he walks around the says, you know, tell me what your issue is. And he says, well, I'm, you know, whatever. He looks young like me and he says, I'm, you know, I'm not sure, but I get like these hot flashes, right? And I get these hot flashes a lot. And Dr. Ross says, well, it's very, very normal for men to have the same hormonal issues that women do, blah, blah, blah. And I can't ask, you know, gosh, I'm a 35-year-old male. I don't remember having hormonal problems and stuff like that. So I wrote to Dr. Ross, yeah. right, because I just seen like hundreds of cases of this. And I said, you know, Bennett, your show is great, and I really admire it. And I said, you know, because I'm even from Columbia. And I said, you know, if you need an Asian, young Asian correspondent, you know, <laughs> I said, but I just caught your show, and, and it was um, about, uh, it's called Am I Normal? You need to decide. He said, he, he was hot flashing. I said, you know, it actually is not common for young men to have hot flashes. I said, you know, it's probably unlikely, but you should probably find out he doesn't have an instead of carcinoid. He'll be flushing from it. So he writes back to me and he says, he says, Eric, I'm glad you went, well, you know, I'll check. So he never got back to me, so I don't really know. But, you know, look, it could be, right? And it's just, you know, you, you don't see it and think about it. It's very easy to attribute this kind of mild symptom to something else. So it's, and it's very, very tricky. And again, you know, look, I mean, he had like 30 seconds to figure it out. Clearly, he wasn't going to figure it out. But it's, it's just something. So you have to understand that there are a lot of things to do. A lot of people can wheeze, too. You know, 
uh, that's it's not uncommon for people to have really bad carcinoma weeds. So you can have a multi-systemic kind of kind of complicated scenario. Okay, so here are the various symptoms. I'm sure a lot of you are dealing with that. The one thing I do want to show you is that this is from 1996. The amount of right heart disease was extremely common, what we call carcinoid heart disease. But since the advent of octreotide and samstatin, that, that has gone way, way down. I'm not, I barely see any of those anymore. And so I'm, it's like a huge medical triumph. So I'm very proud to always show this slide because this is way down here nowadays. Okay, but look, this is very classic. This is very classic, right? Here you have some primary tumor. It's been sitting there for what, five, 10, 15 years, minding its own business. And it somehow gives you some vague abdominal pain, right? Then it metastasizes, and then, ooh, then you figure it out. But by then you start to flush, and you get diarrhea. And look, it is a cancer. People die of it, right? I, mean, I know, I've seen this before, and it hurts my heart every single time. But that's what happens. And this is what we live with, okay? And it, you can get a bunch of weird symptoms, right? You can get like sugar problems with insulinomas, you can get a bunch of diabetes, or, or you know, it's, it's classic. You get this dermatologist who's chasing this rash, right? And then, you know, you put creams on, you can never get rid of it. And it turns out it's metastatic from a tumor, a quick on right? Gastronoma, someone who's got these bad ulcers, right? That you just can't get rid of. Or someone who's got diarrhea like 25 times a day, right? I mean, sure, maybe they were in Mexico and that was the problem. But, you know, most of the time, you know, they haven't been in Mexico, so I think about something else, right? So, and these people are in bad shape. When you have diarrhea 25 times a day, it's like having cholera, right? So that means you're dehydrated, your potassium is incredibly low, and you are miserable, right? So these are very, very powerful cancers that can cause a lot of problems. Okay, so now, what do all the tests mean, right? So what are you, you going to get? You guys have all had these tests, I'm sure, right? This 5-HIA, gastrins, these are all markers, okay? And they're not perfect markers, they're good markers. But you know they, they are used to help follow your burden of disease and try to help you diagnose what, whatever it is that ails you. Okay, so in, in a way those are very good. And some of them are, are drawn from the blood and some are drawn from the urine. Okay, anyone had a urinary 5-HIA done? Right, of course you had it done. Right? Is it a nuisance? Yeah, sure, it's a nuisance. Right. Well, I am happy to say that there's a new blood 5-HIA test which works very very well. So if you can get that, if you can get your doctor to order that. That would certainly serve sure you a lot better. Okay. We've got other weird ones too. Chromogranin A, right? You've all had chromogranin A before, I'm sure of that. There's a B version too. People are starting to work as pancreastatin. You know, we have this neuron of enolase and other markers. But you know what? They're not perfect. Okay, you have to understand that. They always take that word, you know, there are people who are obsessed with their lab markers, right? And I don't blame them for being obsessed, but just understand that they're not perfect. Because I've had to do this before. If someone had an elevated chromogranin A, the docs said, oh, of course you have neuron injury. Right? Actually, that's good, obviously, they thought about it. But then I'm chasing this, right? So if you take Nexium or Prilosec or Protons or whatever your, 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 your acid drug of choice, you will have a falsely elevated permogranin A, okay? So sometimes it just requires some of the experience to know that, right? Just chase that down and just figure that out. So permogranin is not perfect, okay? It's good, it, it helps, us. it's our best general markers, what people do. It kind of gives you an idea about tumor mass and increases you know, in progression of disease. But really, if you have this, renal failure, atrophic gastritis, or of course this PPI, the next same kind of phenomenon, it's going to be wrong. You know, okay. 5-HIA, the urine test that we all get, right, is great. You know, serotonin is a, right, for those of you who don't know, it's a breakdown product of serotonin, right? And serotonin is usually the hormone that comes from these tumors. It's not perfect. You, for surely you can have a, ton of parsimony in your body and no 5-HIA, and that's just because your tumor doesn't make it. But if you do make it, and you do have the test, you can't eat bananas, you can't eat chocolate, you can't eat walnuts, right? And the reason you can't do that is because serotonin is the happy drug. And these are all happy foods. And so, you know, you can't, you, you can't otherwise you'll falsely elevate that as well. So I had to chase down an urinary 5-HIA for avocados. So I just understand it's a problem. There are other medications too. But it is actually very useful because if someone has a high 5-HIA, it means they have more disease. And really, it gives me a sense about what their heart values are. Yes, ma'am? Uh, you mean don't take that right before the test. You don't mean we should abstain. No, correct. I'm sorry. Yeah, three days. You should be about three days. Yeah. Oh, my God. I would never ask you to abstain from eating chocolate. Oh, that would be <laughs> awful. I am not a monster. <laughs> Okay, so how about imaging, right? So I know every one of you has had all these kind of weird tests before, right? And they're great, right? So here's your CT scan, you can see a, a mass here in the tail of the pancreas. 
Um, here's another CT scan, and you can see this, this tumor right here, right? You can see all the blood vessels kind of coming around it, and, and uh, this gentleman had, um, had had his original surgery in wherever he was, and then they wanted to operate him again because they left stuff inside there, and he said, uh, I'm out of here. So he came out to Vanderbilt, and we saw him, and um, he said he was concerned because that he thought surgery said we're gonna take out much more of your intestine. So when I operated him, I peeled this thing off of his off of his his artery and I left all of his intestine. So you just have to understand sometimes you need to just go to someone who does this frequently so that they can do kind of the fancy things for you. Or you know, more appropriate, whatever you want to call it. But CT is not great in the sense that sometimes it shows you stuff you don't want to see, right? So here are three CT scans of livers, okay? You don't have to be a radiologist to see the problem here. Now my question would be, how do you 